Hey guys, so today I'm going to be talking about Hamalhera Gecko Care. So I have my male's enclosure here, this is Yarbles, and then I have Marbles, who is my female, she's over there in a separate enclosure. Um, I won't be taking Yarbles out because he's currently shedding and I don't want to interrupt his shedding process. So I'm just going to briefly go over the care, the basics, and so you guys can get an idea if you're interested in the species, whether it's right for you or not. So Hamalhera gecko is also known as Tahira marginata, can reach up to a foot long. They're one of the larger species of geckos in the world, which is pretty neat because, I mean, they do get pretty big. I saw this guy's dad at the show. They had his father on display and, oh, he was a big boy. <laughs> so they get pretty big. Not like Lichiana's big, but they get a pretty hefty size for a gecko. Another thing about these guys in the pet trade is that they are commonly sold as wild caught. And the issue with wild caught specimens, like with any species of wild caught animal, they are harder to acclimate to captive bred living. Uh, they're pickier, they can be full of parasites or other diseases. So if you do get a wild caught specimen, take it to the vet immediately because you want to get a fecal test done and you know get dewormer and all that fun stuff. So I just recommend getting a captive bred specimen because you're also not supporting the wild caught trait. Um, also by buying a captive bred specimen, you're encouraging more people to breed these guys and there's really not that many breeders. Like I got both of my guys from the same breeder and I've only heard of like a handful within a year of people that breed these guys. And I do plan on breeding them when I feel comfortable with it. My female still needs to mature <laughs> quite a bit, so it probably won't be for another year. So I have plenty of time to continue my research into it and decide if it is the right thing for me. But if it's not, these guys are really cool pets. Another really interesting thing about these guys is they're commonly sold as an entirely different species, which can make it very confusing for new keepers. So these guys will commonly be mislabeled as Tahira vorax, and vorax geckos are considered the true Hamalhera gecko. Confusing, I know. <laughs> so vorax geckos are nearly impossible, if not impossible, to get in captivity. Vorax also look different from marginata. The key differences is vorax kind of have the patterning of like a chihuahua, where they're skin looks like chunks of moss and bark, whereas marginata, they're pretty much solid with varied patterns, but it's not nothing dramatic like a vorax gecko. There's some bad advice going around online, which I saw quite frequently when I was researching these guys, that you can tell what species they are by the color of their eyes, and I would say that's not accurate at all. I have a green-eyed male and a blue-eyed female marginata, and they're both the same exact species, so I wouldn't go by eye color. That's not really a reliable way to identify them. One thing about these geckos, which I know intimidate a lot of people, it's honestly not as bad as it sounds, but if you're new to a species like this that has this defense mechanism, then it can be pretty intimidating. So, much like day geckos, these guys can slough their skin off when they feel threatened. So you cannot forcefully grab these geckos. And that can make, you know, kind of a stressful scenario because they're very fast. So if they take off, you can't just simply like grab them because their skin could come off and you don't want that. Now when their skin comes off, it's not, you know, like bloody and horrific you'll just see pink flesh underneath their skin and it takes a few weeks to a few months to heal but it, it's not detrimental to their health it will stress them out uh, understandably i mean if you if i lost a section of my skin i'd be pretty stressed out but it you know as long as you keep the enclosure clean and you're keeping your humidity up it should heal back to normal fine so when you have a gecko that is very fast and can slough off its skin, you're like, oh, well, how do you handle that? The truth is, I don't handle these guys really frequently. I only do it when I'm cleaning out their enclosures. So they are definitely more on the spectrum of a display pet. And I hate saying that because it's like, oh, so you're just going to sit there and look at them? And it's like, yeah, actually, I do. I sit at night in this room when it's dark. I sit very still because if I move, they're going to you know, see me and run away. 
I sit very still and I watch them like the creep that I am. So they are very fun to watch. They are very active at night and um, it's fun to watch them eat. This guy's an absolute pig. He just, you know, he just like scoops it up with his mouth. It's like me at Cold Stone. It's quite a sight. So as far as housing goes, a, for an adult, a 20 to 30 gallon vertical enclosure is will suit them really well. As far as if you're not, you know, looking to do a converted enclosure, which you might rethink once I point out some of the flaws in this setup, then an 18 by 18 by 24 Exoterra will do fine. You can even go bigger than that. These guys appreciate space. They will utilize every inch of it. They're very active, like I said before. So with my conversion here, which I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. Yes, this is ugly. It's hideous. I understand, but it keeps my door on here. So if I want to remove it, there you go. It's removed. I did try the clips, but they were a pain. I didn't like them at all. I also thought about doing the conversion kits um, that they sell for these, but I got one for a 10 gallon closure. And honestly, I'm just not digging the functionality of it, if it makes any sense. It's just, I like being able to take the entire front off, especially for cleaning. So I'm just sticking with this for now until I can get an Exoterra, which I plan on moving both of mine into separate Exoterras. If you go with an enclosure like this, you're gonna have to mist more often. So with an Exoterra or a Zoomed enclosure, you could probably get away with misting twice a day, in the once in the morning and once at night. Whereas these, I have to mist these guys three times a day just because there's so much airflow. So the humidity doesn't really stick because there's not stagnant air in here. I also have a fan and a HEPA filter in the room, so it just really moves the air around and therefore the moisture just gets like sucked out of here. Um, as far as percentage of humidity, you want around 60 to 80 percent for humidity for these guys. Um, 60 on the lower end, like during the day when the enclosure needs a dry period, and then 80 percent in the evenings and in the mornings. With temperatures, you want your ambient temperature, which is your just overall air. like. I am sitting in ambient temperature right now. So this whole cage, you're gonna want it to be around 75 to 80, 80 degrees. They do like it on the warmer end, opposed to crested geckos who like it on the cooler end. These guys do appreciate a little extra warmth. So I have the room at about 78 consistently throughout the day, and then it drops to around 75, 74 at night. As far as the basking area, now this is actually one of the most debated things about these geckos I've noticed is do they need a basking light or not? I was under the impression when I got them that they did not need a basking light, so I didn't have one for them. And, you know, a few months later I was like, you know what, I'm gonna add a basking light and just see what happens. Because I know they're, I stupidly assumed, I'm like, okay, well they're nocturnal they're not gonna want a basking light, you know, they're not out during the day. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> as soon as I added basking light, my male was basking all day. He loves sitting under his basking light or near it a lot of the time, so now I just have it on all day. Um, as far as these enclosures go, again, you don't want to put the light directly on top of the glass because it will crack and then you will have a shattered enclosure and that's like every reptile keeper's worst nightmare. <laughs> So you're going to want to have something that holds the lamp above the glass. I use bricks because, um, well I don't know, they were laying around and I was like, oh I could use these. But <laughs> I have the lamp here about three inches from the glass so there is a space underneath providing airflow so it doesn't get too hot. Also, as you can see I can stick my hand under here and it's not broiling hot or burning but it does provide a nice basking area on his log back here. I highly recommend that you do use a basking bulb just because they really, they will appreciate it. They do like, you know, they do enjoy basking. As far as UVB goes, you can absolutely use UVB with these guys if you'd like. The issue, again, with these cages is that the top is glass, so the glass is just going to filter the UV light and it's just going to be a plain light to them, so until I can move them into an exoterra, I personally don't have UVB. I just supplement with vitamin D3 and it's working for now, but yes, I do plan on upgrading. Um, as far as 
the cage setup itself, you want a lot of foliage. They utilize vertical space, so you want a lot of vertical climbing things like cork bark or vines, bamboo, all of that stuff. I noticed my Hamel hair geckos actually spend a lot of the time on the sides of their enclosures, so you do want to have like stuff propped up against them that they can hang out on. Um, as far as substrate, I just stick with paper towels for now. When I I do plan on moving them to bioactive, but for now, I don't see bioactive really working out well in these enclosures or the style of enclosure, so I have to wait until I can get my exoterra and then I'm gonna go all bioactive. And maybe I'll do an update video when I do that. I have a water bowl available for him. Now a lot of people say, oh, you don't need the water bowl, you know, it's not necessary, they're not gonna drink out of it. Well, mine love pooping in there, so I'm not gonna deprive them of their poop water bowl for my convenience. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, let's start over. I I just keep it in there just for peace of mind and it adds a little extra humidity to the air So I do like providing a big water bowl, although they do poop in it half the time So if you do provide a water bowl, make sure to check it every day And if there's poops floating in there, change it. As far as diet goes with these guys, Rapashi and Pangea are two excellent choices of gecko diets that you can use they are all complete so you don't have to add anything extra to them although once a week i do add bee pollen to them just to give them a little extra vitamins and minerals if you do use bee pollen do not overdo it because you don't want them getting too much of one thing so i feed my adults every other day to every three days you don't want to feed them every day they will become obese if you do that so um just keep an eye on their weight and adjust their feedings as you go Babies can eat every day. I mean, they're growing, so they need all that extra food to grow. You can also feed these guys insects. Now, mine absolutely hate insects. I have tried crickets, I've tried roaches, I've tried silkworms, hornworms, just a whole bunch of things, and they will not touch them. So I take Rapashi grub pie and I mix it in with their other diets as well as buy Pangea and Rapashi flavors that include insects in them and it seems to be working really well for them. So if your gecko refuses to touch insects, live insects, there is always a backup for that. You can feed insects about twice a week and then you're going to want to dust the insects as well with a multivitamin and calcium powder. So if you are using a UVB light, you're going to want to use calcium without D3. And if you are using a UV light, you're going to want to use calcium without D3. And that is because when you use a UVB light, they're already getting that D3, so they just need the calcium and it balances out. Also, do not buy calcium with phosphorus in it because there's no way to make sure that the phosphorus and calcium ratios are close to each other. So you can end up giving them imbalanced supplements and then that actually just ends up being bad for their health. Uh, the multivitamin I use is Reptivite and it works really well for me. So I do that about once a week. One piece of advice that I commonly saw in care sheets for these guys online was to give them baby food. Don't give them baby food, please. <laughs> It's just so full of sugar and it's processed, so there's really no nutritional value in it for these guys, so try to avoid giving them baby food. Um, if you don't have access to Crested Gecko food at a store, you can easily order it online. And they're, honestly, there's just really no excuse to feed your geckos baby food. They do enjoy treats every once in a while. You can offer them a little piece of banana, you know, like once a month. They really like that, so you can keep that in mind if you want to treat your gecko every once in a blue moon. So some extra things to consider with these guys is gecko proofing your room. These guys are very fast and they can be very scared of you, so if you open their enclosure and they get disturbed, they can just boom, you know, they're gone. They're climbing up something, under something, so whatever room you're keeping them in or plan on taking them out in, make sure that it is gecko proof. So if, it, if you have a window open, close it. If you have a vent open, close it. If you have an area under something where they can get to, say like under something like this, you know, block that off with a blanket or a towel just so they can't get under there. You don't want them to go somewhere where you cannot keep track of them or find them again. Another thing you're gonna to wanna to keep in the back of your head when you're working with these guys is you have to keep calm. So if your gecko comes flying out of its enclosure and it's running around, you can't like panic. It's just gonna make the situation worse. It's gonna be stressful for you. It's gonna be stressful for the gecko. And you just gotta keep calm. Keep a clear mind and just take a deep breath and go, 
I am gonna get this guy. I'm gonna put him back in his enclosure and then I'm gonna go have a mental breakdown in the bathroom over there. And the last thing, the last thing that I'm gonna tell you about these guys is you wanna keep a pool noodle if you're keeping these geckos. Why, you might ask? Because sometimes when these guys get out of their enclosures, they go up. They go up to the ceiling and they just, I've had yarbles just crawl across the ceiling like it's no big deal. And you don't want to take something sharp or hard and poke them to coax them down. So I have a pool noodle so I can just very gently coax them to the side of the wall where I can get a hold of them, put them back in their enclosure. So just keep a pool noodle around just in case. It's just, for me, it brings me peace of mind knowing I have something that I can get my gecko down with that won't hurt him and will be less stressful for me than like standing up with a giant tub and just hoping the gecko crawls to the bottom so I can slowly bring it down and put him back in his enclosure. With that being said, <laughs> that is how I take care of my Hamohara geckos. If you guys have any further questions, feel free to message me on my Instagram, Reptile Smiles. I will do my best to answer your questions. And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think of these geckos because they're really cool. They are a very rewarding species to keep, but they can be a bit stressful for someone that does not have experience with more quick geckos. So thanks for watching my video and I'll see you guys next time.